The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always with our Week in Review shows, I'm joined by CGSP's managing editor, Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, and our Africa editor, Jeronima in Mauritius. A very good evening to both of you. Good evening. Good evening. Guys, it has been a very busy week. When we were looking for guests for the show this week, we thought there are just too many topics and too much to cover. So we thought, let's just get the three of us together for this show. And by the way, again, as we said in our Global South show, we want to wish everybody who is celebrating the Chinese New Year holiday that's just getting underway in Vietnam, in China, Japan, Korea, so much of that part of the world. We want to wish everybody a happy Year of the Dragon as everybody's embarking on their big holiday festivities. And much of that part of the world is going to slow down over the next week. So just a quick Happy New Year to everybody there. But this week, a lot happened before the New Year, particularly in China-Kenya relations. We're going to talk about all the movement there. Giraud is going to help us better understand the complexities of this new announcement of a $7 billion restructuring of the Sino-Congolese mining deal in the DRC. And then we're going to talk about the Italy-Africa summit and all of these Africa Plus One summits, especially because FOCAC is coming up this year. So let's first start on the Kenya-China beat. Gentlemen, it was a very, very active week. Over the past even two weeks, we've seen just this week, Kenya's new ambassador to Beijing, Willy Bet, presented his credentials to President Xi Jinping in Beijing. He did that on Tuesday, and that officially confirmed his role as Nairobi's newest envoy to the Chinese capital. Last week, Kenya's cabinet secretary for foreign affairs, Musalia Mudavadi, he spent three days in Beijing to follow up on some of the issues that his boss, President William Rutu, raised during his trip to China last fall during the Belt and Road Forum. This was very interesting because it pushed China-Kenya relations right to the fore again. And Mudavadi made some remarks in Beijing about the importance that the Ruto administration places on ties with China. And before we get into our analysis of everything that's going on in China-Kenya relations, let's take a listen now to some of the comments by the cabinet secretary. It's clear that China is very pivotal on global issues, on regional issues, and they're going to play an important role not just today, but going forward, including in multilateral uh, bodies such as the United Nations and and other critical areas in the financial realm and so many others. So we have no option but to really engage with China at the highest level and very, very uh, seriously. One of the key things is that we must always remember the very cardinal principle of the one China policy. We have underscored it. Uh, We'll always underscore it because it is so near uh, to them uh, and to this nation. And that is something we must always respect as we do uh, our uh, partnerships in various areas. Kobus, very interesting that within the first three minutes of Mudavadi's speech on China-Kenya relations, he genuflects to the One China policy. And I think it reflects the new priority that the Chinese are encouraging, compelling, persuading, cajoling all of their partners around the world to reinforce is this question of the One China policy. What did you hear in those comments from the cabinet secretary? And what did you think of the visit that happened. 
In relation to Taiwan, clearly anxiety around Taiwan is high in Beijing, you know, so it is interesting how everywhere around the world, you know, kind of people are now suddenly rediscovering the one China policy and, you know, kind of re-pledging their allegiance. So that, that's interesting to hear. I also noted that in the new kind of agreements that came out between Kenya and China, now also echoing of some other Chinese language in the Kenyan pronouncements, particularly around uh, non-interference, you know, and, and the, the kind of non-interference by, by kind of foreign powers. So, so it, was, it was interesting. But, you know, overall, obviously, I think the Kenya-China relationship is both a really pivotal one, but also one, I think, where the two partners are frequently on very different pages, you know, and, and where there seems to be not necessarily always such great communication between them. And so in that sense, these kind of announcements of new mechanisms of cooperation, I think, will probably end up hopefully kind of smoothing the relationship a little bit, because frequently there seem to be a lot of kind of like loose ends in this relationship. Let's talk about the takeaways from the Mudavadi visit. And one of the things that the cabinet secretary would like to focus on, and this was a story that came out in the Nation newspaper by the excellent reporter Agri Mutambo, who wrote that Kenya plans to put in writing its policy towards China. That hasn't been done before, supposedly taking lessons from a chaotic first year of President William Ruto's term in dealing with Beijing. That's written by Agri Mutambo. Agri goes on to say the first step is to set up focal points in government, some type of agency that will directly deal with Chinese affairs. Now, Giraud, this is, on one hand, progress, because this is what we've been talking about on the show for many years, about the need for African governments to develop some internal competency about China. The Kenyan foreign ministry does have a China desk. It has been really not very much of a success because the desk has struggled to get ideas up the chain of command to the leadership. But let me just also bring up the point of the new ambassador, Willie Bett, and how in many ways he's part of the problem. Now, Willie Bett has no China experience. He's the former ambassador to India. He's the former cabinet secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture. And he comes from a background in the corporate sector where he was the managing director of the Kenya Seed Company. There is nothing apparently in Willie Bett's background other than his close relationship with the president that qualifies him to be the ambassador to China. So on the one hand, Giraud, we have this encouraging statement from the foreign affairs cabinet secretary that says we're going to create this whole competency about China. And on the other hand, the main point person on the China relationship knows very little about China. Unless they want to make agriculture as a focus point for the next five years between Kenya and China relation. Let's remember since last year, Kenya has been exporting avocado to China and they've been trying to expand the agriculture base to export to China. Unless they want to go to that direction, his appointment may be explained. And the other fact that we can take into account is the fact that unless they also have a very strong administrative apparatus back home in Nairobi and also in Beijing that can accompany him to do that, I think his profile won't be a problem. But I doubt that they have that because since now the Foreign Affairs Minister has been talking about the need to really formalize, to put it in writing, just tells you that the reality on the ground is like they still have to build that apparatus, that strong china focus apparatus that can allow them to say, we can allow ourselves not to have a good profile ambassador or the one that doesn't have a China experience into it. So I think, yes, his profile might be a problem and they're going to have to do much more into that and to see what they're going to get from that. So I'm really kind of curious on how they're going to implement that strategy. First of all, what's going to be the main line? Because when you read Agri paper, you kind of see that, you know, it's going to be centered around the partnership they've sent with China, the strategic global partnership they have now with China. They're going to have to put a bilateral commission to talk about with Chinese on what would be the priorities and everything. But I'll be more curious to see how they're going to, for themselves from Kenya, what Kenya is really putting on the table to see this is my priority with China, where we are going, not only William Ruto, but for the next 10, 15, 20 years, because I think that's kind of policy is kind of important. And uh, 
Let's now see how the internal politics within Kenya is going to play out on how they're going to write that paper and how it's going to play out on, down the line. But I want to get back a bit on Kobe's on the comment he made about the Taiwan thing or how China is getting a bit worried about that. At the end, do you think it's really much more a worry than a kind of need to send a message to Taiwan to say, we want to let you know how much isolated that you are. We are not really afraid of you, but we want to show you how much isolated that you are. Even though you have a new president, let us remind Mind you that you know you have no space where you can move on the international stage because no one is recognizing you as a country. And uh, if you're keeping score at home of Taiwan's shrinking list of diplomatic partners around the world, that list got a little bit smaller this week when the small South Pacific island of Nauru switched its diplomatic allegiances to Beijing and the Chinese five-star flag rose for the first time in 19 years over that small Pacific island country. And Tuvalu, another small Pacific island country that still recognizes Taiwan, is apparently on the fence and may switch its allegiances as well. So Taiwan's diplomatic space to maneuver, as Giraud pointed out, is getting smaller. And it's very interesting that, again, even in the African pronouncements, this is a priority. Let's have a little fun, though, now with the thought experiment that if the cabinet secretary, Giraud and Kobus, called us up and said, China Global South Project, you guys cover China really well. You're impartial. You're agenda free. We need your help to set up this new division within the foreign ministry on how to deal with China and how to study China and how to build this China literacy and this China competency that you guys have been going on so much about over the past few years. I'm now going to give you a little bit of money and give you the mandate to design this program for us. Kobus, let's start with you. What would you tell Cabinet Secretary Mudavadi about what you would do to set up a functioning, effective China team within the foreign ministry to handle China policy? Give us your overview. And then, Jero, while he's talking about it, I want you to think about the same thing. Probably in the first place, I'd suggest some of the really excellent Kenyan academics who focus on China-Africa relations and some of the like kind of cohort of grad students who've, who've studied in China um, and who can, who can speak Mandarin. But to do what? Can you be specific? Let's be very practical as if the foreign ministry is listening to us. What would be two or three practical suggestions to set up this team that you would recommend? I think I would set up a division that specifically looks at contracts, both retrospectively and into the future, you know, because Kenya keeps campaigning to do more infrastructure building with China. And, you know, it's had such troubled contracts before. So, you know, kind of making sure that China you know, kind of agency contains a strong legal and particularly kind of contract capacity, you know, would be one, particularly contract experts who can speak Mandarin and can read Mandarin specifically. I would have an agricultural expert in there and and particularly an agricultural developmental expert who can particularly look at boosting trade, you know, very concretely. And then I think I would have someone in there who, who can keep an eye on the political weaponization of China within Kenya, because we've, we've seen that as well. You know, that particularly kind of retail, like small scale retail, for example, has become this kind of political football within Kenyan politics. So the agency would have to have not only strong China capacity, but strong local Kenyan political capacity as well. Giro, okay. You pick up on that, and what would you advise both the president and the cabinet secretary on how to build an effective China team? For me, it will start by having people expert on China political history, because as many of us know, most of us, we know that Chinese foreign policy is driven by what's happening internally. You cannot understand China trajectory on international relations if you do not understand what's driving China politics within the country. And first of all, also having people who really understand China internal policy, internal dynamic of China's internal economic dynamics, regional relation to kind of now understand why regions are playing an important role in China foreign policy in the interaction with Africa. To understand understand, for instance, why China is not easy to forgive debt when they themselves have an internal economic issue and how it plays out. I want to have people who are really expert on China CCP because it's quite important to understand the different dynamics within the CCP that drives China foreign policy, especially when it comes to Africa, and to understand where Africa is really standing in China's priority. Once you understand that big package of China foreign policy drivers, now you understand where Africa do stand in that space. That's why I'm going to add into the list 
someone who has a global geopolitical view where you have China, India, United States, G7 country, and how China is playing within that. Because once you understand that, you understand that maybe Africa is not as much as important that we believe that we are to China, and maybe Kenya is not as much as important. So the question be, how in that space, where China is moving with those countries, where am I going to move further with its agenda? And of course, knowing what are China's red lines, because you cannot deal with China without knowing what China red lines are, how important they are, when they can move on that. So for me, it's going to be the main important points I'm going to be putting on the table, and the priority is going to be on that part if you want to build a China team. In that sense, I think it might not be such a dumb thing. If you happen to have a relative lack of people with kind of Asia experience in your top level diplomats, then sending your former ambassador to India to be ambassador to China is maybe not the dumbest move. Because anyone who's spent time in Kenya and in East Africa knows the strength of the Indian presence there. And we also know that engagement with China comes filtered through engagement with India, you know, kind of just geographically. So, so in that sense, you know, someone with strong Indian competence and, and with a strong awareness of the India-US geopolitics surrounding China would be useful, I think. But the question will be also, Kenya will have to be clear on what they want to get exactly from China. They have to be clear about that because most of the time many African countries fail to address that issue. I think that's going to be the most important. Is China our economic partner, our political partner, trade partner, or our security partner? And what do we want all of it, and what do we want to get from China exactly? Okay, so Giro, to that point, that's where I'm going to step in. And this is going to pick up on what Kobus talked about, that is the importance of the China competence of this team is going to be critical. And if you cannot find the talent in Kenya, there is an amazing reservoir of talent elsewhere in Africa that you can draw on to help support you on this team. So the information inputs to figure out what is it that Kenya wants are going to be very, very important. So that should come from not only Kenyans, but also other scholars, analysts, academics, news sources, information inputs that are around Africa and even around the world, really diving into the aid data, some of the Johns Hopkins data, diving into all of the, the research coming out of SIA and other places, and then filtering that so that you can get to this point that you brought up, Giro, about what is it that Kenya wants. And that brings up the other point, which is to be a little bit careful that China has been very effective over the years in bringing over countless scholars and journalists and analysts to China to uh, sway it towards its worldview and making sure that when you get those inputs, you're getting really unvarnished, multifaceted, all perspectives types of inputs. And also making sure that the ambassador in Beijing is not the only one who speaks to the president on China. And this has been a problem with a lot of the African diplomatic community is that the relationship over China is controlled in many respects by the ambassador. And it's really important that the president get a plurality of views. The ambassador is very important. There's no doubt. He is the point person on the ground in Beijing. He's speaking with the government. And there's no way to diminish that. But if that is the only view or the predominant view, unfortunately, that is also a very limiting view. And so I would hope that this new team is empowered to sometimes challenge the ambassador's view, provide alternative views, alternative perspectives, so that the president does get competing choices on how to deal with China. Eric, if you allow me a side story on that, I won't name the country, but because we, when you made the comment about how in many African countries, the ambassadors in Beijing are driving the China policy, you'd be surprised that when it comes to certain countries, the ambassador is completely oblivious of what's happening between his country and China. Sometimes you have government sending representatives straight from the capital to go to Beijing to negotiate big contracts without the ambassador being involved in the process of vetting anybody, of choosing anybody, and it's just like reading the news as anybody else finding out that, you know, his minister arrived in Beijing last month or this arrived last year or coming straight from the presidents in ex capitals. And, that, you know, sometimes those stories are just quite funny to see. This is where you see the dysfunction among African diplomats in Beijing when it comes to China. You realize that only few countries do really have a sound ad diplomatic administrative apparatus when they deal with China. Most of them, you have like special envoy who arrived in Beijing without even talking to an ambassador on that they're coming to Beijing to negotiate contracts. 
and I'll say it for you, Giro, because this is something you've said over and over again, is that these African governments would benefit enormously if they took advantage of the huge pool of talent of students and graduates who've studied in China, like yourself, to who have the knowledge, who speak the language, and that the next time that President Rutu or President Chesakedi or President Ishilema goes to China, that they bring their own interpreters and that they bring their own talent and they don't rely on the Chinese. This is something we've seen over and over again is these amateur mistakes in terms of not even bringing your own interpreters is something that is tragic. So we hope that they'll take advantage of this wonderful population of graduates and students who've studied there and have this great knowledge. And again, more and almost than anywhere else in the world. You, you calculated somewhere around 650, almost 700,000 students over the past 15 years have studied there. But this is a, a resource that has not been taken advantage of. So if Mr. Mudavadi wants to reach out to us, we would be happy to help <laughs> to build this new team. I doubt he ever would, but nonetheless, you know, it's a new business development opportunity for us, guys, but uh, unlikely that, but hopefully they'll listen to us on this one. Okay, let's move our conversation to your home country, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Giro. A couple of weeks ago, President Felix Chesikedi was sworn in for his second term in office after he won what a lot of people called a very controversial election when he took home 70% of the vote in a contest that both the opposition and international observers said was flawed. Nonetheless, the DRC's constitutional court validated the outcome last week or the week before that paved the way for the big gathering that took place on January 20th at the iconic Stade des Martyrs in Kinshasa. Isn't that where they did the rumble in the jungle? No, that was another stadium, just not far from there, though. Oh, I always thought that's where they did the rumble and jungle. Okay. But during his inaugural address, Chesa Cady had one line in there that caught a lot of our attention and how he had renegotiated mining contracts with the Chinese that would produce $7 billion in new funding for infrastructure. That's all he said. No details, nothing. $7 billion. I called up Giro and I said, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that was a, okay. And then we didn't know anything more. He, there was no details that came out of it. I kind of thought at first of like, this is just a political ploy because he was under so much pressure in his first term to do something on these contracts. And so I wasn't really sure if there was any substance to it or it was just politics. But then last week, we started to find out more about what he was talking about. Here's what we know so far. And Giro, I want you to then flesh this out for us. Chinese construction companies will invest up to keyword there, up to $7 billion in infrastructure as part of a revised agreement with the Sikumin's copper and cobalt joint venture that operates together between the Congolese state-run mining company Jekamines and a consortium of Chinese companies. Both the Chinese partners in Jekamines agreed to maintain the current structure of the shareholding, while the main Chinese partners, the two main partners are Sino Hydro and China Railway Group Limited, will pay 1.2% of royalties annually to the Congolese government. That's where the money's going to come from. Now, if this is in fact the case, this is a huge win for the president who's been pushing for restructuring the 2008 Sicko Means deal that was valued back then at $6.2 billion. And you'll recall, if you followed this, this was then the deal of the century. And it was really China's big entree into Africa. But pretty much everyone except the Chinese agreed that this deal back then, signed under Chesakati's predecessor, Joseph Kabila, was highly flawed, and it understated the metal reserves that were all in China's favor. So, the original deal promised $3 billion in infrastructure projects paid for by the proceeds from the copper and cobalt mine in the Sicko Means deal. I think by any measure, people have said that has not lived up to the expectations. Now it seems like that number is going to go up a lot. Giro. Help us understand what's going on here. So I'm going to make it simple. Let's start by the big number, 7 billion. Is it 7 billion? Yes and no. It's 7 billion for the whole duration of the project, which include what was signed before and what remained to sign before. It was the 3 billion before and, you know, basically 3 billion plus 4 billion, 7 billion. So... The way they get to 7 billion is not 7 billion new dollars. It's taking the existing three and adding four, correct? Exactly. Okay. That's a very important distinction to make there. 
it means that if the Sikomin had invested all three billion before in infrastructure, it means that we would have four billion remaining. But the problem is right now is the fact that there was a dispute between what was already invested. China, Sikomin was talking about between one to 1.5 billion already invested. The DRC was talking about 882 million only invested in infrastructure, which means that we have now a kind of, in terms of a ballpark, we have between five to five point billion dollar remaining to be invested invested in the infrastructure until the end of the partnership. How long is it going to take? I think it's 25 years, so until the end of the partnership. This is the first point. The second point now, we have like every year, they're going to have $324 million invested for infrastructure, which means that if you take between 5 to 5 $5 billion, it's going to take 16 to 17 years for Sikomin to kind of cover all of that. Third point is the fact that that money is going to come from the proceed from the SICO. I mean, much more detail came out yesterday. The details are telling us is the fact that they're going to take when Sikomin do the commercialization of copper, they're going to take 35% of what they've sold. The 35% is going to go for infrastructure, and the remaining, they're going to divide them between 68% for China's and 32% for, you know. Can I stop you for, right there? I just want to get one point very clear here, because it's on the proceeds of the sale. Now, this is a little bit concerning here, because the price of cobalt now is rock bottom. Yeah. And when we see the announcements now coming out of the major automakers and car batteries, EV car batteries are the largest use of cobalt, by no means the only use of cobalt. It goes into a lot of electronics, but lots of it goes into car batteries. When BYD announced its new factory in Indonesia, it's doing lithium phosphate batteries, cobalt free batteries. Nissan is using LFP batteries. Everybody seems to want to get away from using cobalt batteries. So there's no indication that the price of cobalt anytime soon is going to go up. And that means that if they are doing this on the proceeds, if the price of cobalt remains as low as it is today, well, does that mean then the share of money that goes for this infrastructure is going to be reduced? But the interesting part is they're not doing that on the proceeds of the cobalt. They're only doing it on the proceeds of copper. And copper's up high. Copper's doing well. Okay, that's good to hear. That's very interesting. Exactly. So they made a calculation based around $8,000 ton for copper. So even the, the general audit office was saying that we agree that if the copper price goes low, that number can go low from year to year. If the copper price goes high, we agree it can go high. So basically they went around the copper price, not the cobalt price. So that's what they did in India. In your data that you did last year, we did one of the first mappings of the entire cobalt copper supply chain in the DRC. And one of the findings that surprised me the most was that while we're talking a lot about cobalt, because that's considered to be a critical resource, a strategic mineral, whatever you want to call it, the fact is that the Sikomin's joint venture focuses mostly on copper. Can you remind us on what the breakdown is in SICO means between their cobalt production and their copper production? The data that we did have, because we're going to update to 2023, but up to 2022, SICO produced in 2022 257 tons of copper. But in terms of cobalt, it's only produced something around... 2,400 tons of cobalt, way less, way, way less than the CMOG, the KCC and everything exactly. Sikomin is quite a small place when it comes to cobalt. That's why you kind of understand why they put the money much more on, on the cobalt proceed than the cobalt proceed. So yeah. That's what we get over there. So when you take that, what didn't change basically is the fact that, yeah, the Chinese maintain the majority share in the Sikomin, 68, 32% for the DRC. And uh, they got now every year to be able to pay 324 million per year for infrastructure. And the DRC got some other advantage in terms of like administrative position within the Sikomin to get some people coming after the direct generals and different position within the Sikomin. So allowing the DRC to have much more control on what 
what's happening over there. And one thing interesting that's happened as well is the fact that the DOS is going to receive 1.24% every year in terms of like royalties. And the number they produced yesterday, it was like that number is around 24 million a year. But interesting part, the Secomin maintained the tax exemption of $100 million they get every year as well. So you see that there is something, a game that has been played there between the Chinese and the DRC. At the end, when you look closely, really closely at the deal, it's really hard to see how the Chinese have lost. They kind of managed to maintain the what was more essential to them than anything else. And also they gave President Chisekedi a win, a political win to say, you know, I've been able to renegotiate the contract without really giving up on something major in those deals. Let's not forget that the Chinese and the actors in the Sicko Means deal now have been active in this space for more than a decade, since 2008, and even before 2008. They probably started negotiating this deal in 2006. So we're, we're looking at a long time. And Jiro, one of the things that you've pointed out to us over and over again over the years is that doing business, particularly at this scale in the DRC, is incredibly difficult. And so I think in many respects, based on what you're telling us, this really shows quite a bit of dexterity among the Chinese stakeholders in coming up with deals like this that really ensure their political survival in the Congo. Exactly. Um, they've been able to play the ball quite well. The one something was really interesting is the fact, for example, they've been able to ventilate the payment over 16 to 17 years. So basically, they're not losing anything. And plus, the money is paid by both sides within the Sikomin. So basically, they're sharing the burden of paying infrastructure. Because the main idea was like, China is going to build infrastructure, they're going to get natural resources. But the way the deal is now is like, no, no, we are going to share the you know, the burden of building infrastructure, you're going to take 32%, I'm going to finance a 68%. So basically that's going to happen. And that's what's happening. That's really interesting. It shows you how China can really play the ball in an environment like DRC and maintain its interest intact. Kobus, you had the unenviable task this week of having to try and explain this to our readers in the newsletter and on our site. What's your takeaway from all this? The first thing that struck me was how dexterous China is at playing in this environment. And a lot of the discussion was around what the DRC is getting, what they're not getting. What was, you know, kind of interesting for me, though, is, you know, and Giraud, like, please, I'm not sure if I'm correct on this, but like, as far as I understand, there's no commitment to new comprehensive mineral surveys. Like, we're still, we're still kind of like essentially stuck with the, with the old idea, the possibly incorrect idea of like how much cobalt and, and copper there actually is in the DRC. So, you know, that struck me also as like, you know, in, like the DRC is getting a certain number of things, but I, it doesn't seem like a, a, a real kind of like increase in agency for the DRC, particularly outside of the government. For the population of the DRC doesn't seem to be in that much more of, a, of an empowered position in relation to their own resources than they were before. Am I getting that wrong, Jero? What do you think? No, no, you're really getting it right, totally. Because when you look closely, the problem going to arise in the implementation of the deal itself, because it was really negotiated, really very close circle, where there's not much of transparency on how it went and the details of it. So when it's going to be implemented, we're going to have to look closely on how the money is going to be dispersed, who's going to decide when is the money is going to be dispersed, who's going to choose the contract to build infrastructure, how they're going to be chosen and everything. This is where you, and you will know how much and where the money is going, who's getting what and everything, and if really the DS is going to win on that. Because from the Chinese, it's going to be, we're going to give the money, but whatever you do with the money, whether it's good or bad, it's really none of our problem. If you put the money in your pocket, it's you. The next president is going to come. We're going to tell him, you know, that was done before. That's none of our business. So this is the part where, in terms of Congolese agency within, I mean, in terms of civil society, good government, uh, for the people to know the, what really happen and how they're going to make sure that the deal is really benefiting from them. There's no much internal civil society Congolese agency on that was being negotiated right now. And that is what groups like AfriWatch, one of the more prominent civil society groups in Kinshasa, were calling for. They want to know all of the details of the deal. They want transparency in it. I'm not entirely sure that they're going to get it, but it's encouraging at least that we're hearing those calls from Congolese civil society. Uh, gentlemen, very quickly before we move on to our next topic, just while we stay on this infrastructure beat, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was in Angola about 10 days ago, 
and wrapped up his Four Nation tour there. One of the highlights of the tour for the Americans was the Lobito Corridor. Uh, This ties to the Congo, so for those of you not familiar with the Lobito Corridor, they're upgrading a 1,000-kilometer railway that goes from the copper cobalt belts in Zambia and the DRC to the Atlantic coast port of Lobito. The coverage in the U.S. media was euphoric, like, suck it, China, here we come. We're going to overwhelm all of Chinese infrastructure. And Peter Pham from the Atlantic Council was defiantly going on X and saying, you know, we're, uh, you know, America's back, you know, America. (laughs) And uh, yet it's really important to remember that this is one railroad. It still has not been actually completed, even though the United States Exim Bank has approved a $900 million dollar loan for them. Remember, that's a loan. So these debt questions start to become very interesting. Very quickly, not too much. I'd like to get your takes on the Blinken tour in Angola and this question of infrastructure while we're talking about U.S.-China infrastructure in Africa related to critical minerals. Kobus, first you, then off to Giraud. You know, like I think in a lot of ways, the Lubito Corridor initiative is very promising. I think what was Blinken and the U.S. biggest challenge was convincing Africans that it will still happen if Trump comes to power. I think that's the big thing. Like convincing anyone that anything is going to happen after 2024 is the biggest challenge at the moment because no one knows what America is awaiting us next year. Yeah, I think that's a very good point, whether or not all these plans, these great plans that will take a decade to build. I mean, these are very complex things to do in terms of when you map out all of the facets of the Lobito Corridor. It's not just a railway. They're talking about all these green initiatives, telecommunications initiatives. They take a long time to build. I mean, even if it were just a single rail line, that would still be a big ask, right? Kind of for, for the US, but particularly on the Republicans. Republicans not known for their love of rail. So, you know, particularly not rail in other countries. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let's go, Giraud, to you very quickly. I think the big challenge was, as Kobe said, was to convince that they are committed to the project to, because, let me correct something, they're not building a new rail line within Angola. They, build, they want to build a new one connecting the part of Zambia to the one that's existing in Angola. Correct. And they want to refurbish the one and upgrade the one in Angola. That's right. Exactly, they were to, to break that one. So yeah, I think it's about commitment. They're going to have to show commitment that, you know, we are still going to come through to what we've said, despite Trump maybe coming to power. And I don't know if his message will come across because we still have the Zambia DRC uh, US critical minerals agreement that was signed in December last year. They're still waiting for implementation. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, that thing has got to be dead as a doornail. Anybody who thinks that's going to happen, I've got some property in Florida that I want to sell you. I mean, It is never going to happen. That is well-intentioned. I give the Americans credit for wanting to try to do that, but it just didn't work. I think since they did not put a timeline on needs, maybe they can resuscitate it somewhere midway March, April. Because let's not forget, EU and Zambia, EU and DRC have a similar deal as well. That's may become one of incentive for the US to try to move on in that space as well. But, you know, the issues are still remaining quite big. So I don't know what's going to happen there. The fundamental flaw of that MOU for the critical mineral supply chain among the Zambia, DRC and the US was that it was this vague MOU. It was not a contract. There was no money behind it. There was no commitment behind it. There was no timeline. And it was also signed by the Secretary of State. Yeah. That's not the guy who signs business deals. It would have been far more credible had the Commerce Secretary signed it, had private sector people been involved with it. But the State Department doing business deals, eh, that's never going to be credible. So I don't know. I think that was a flaw from the beginning, the fact that this was more of a political thing when an actor like Blinken is signing something rather than a real business deal that had they had Tesla and Apple and all these American companies at the signing ceremony with firm pledges that they are going to back this and whatnot, and that money was going to change hands within 90 days of the signing, you would have had probably a lot more serious reaction from the Congolese and the Zambian side. That's my take on it. So, okay, let's move on to our final, and Kobus, I can't wait to get your take on this. So uh, leaders and representatives from 45 African countries attended this week's Italy-Africa summit that was hosted by Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney. What was so interesting about this is that this was one of those Africa plus one summits, okay? We've been hearing about these for years about how African stakeholders are fed up with going to these summits. And in fact, you even heard 
the tone coming out of African Union Commission Chair Musafaki, who said, and let me just give you some quotes here, we cannot be satisfied with mere promises that can't be kept. And that's in reference to all of these summits. Remember, there was the Africa Plus One Summit in Russia, in Turkey, in India. What has come out of these things? And by the way, I was very surprised to learn. I assumed that part of the deal was that the Italians would pay for, say, the, some of the African delegations to come. Nope. All of the African delegations have to pay their own way to go to these summits. So very expensive. Let me just say they don't live in the YMCA in Rome when they stay there. And so these are very expensive. And you think back, what came out of the Russia plus Africa summit? What came out of the India summit? And Italy, I mean... Okay, so let me just give you some quotes from Musa Faki. We cannot be satisfied with mere promises that can't be kept, he said. Faki added that there needs to be a, quote, paradigm shift to usher in a new model of partnership and pave the way towards a more just and coherent world. He said, Africa does not want to reach out. We are not beggars. Okay, with that in mind, let me play you a soundbite from last April, from none other than... William Ruto, who we've been talking about a lot on this program, who said, enough of these Africa Plus One summits. Enough. Let's take a listen to what he said. The decision that we have made as AU is that going forward, if there is going to be a discussion between Africa and any other country, we are going to be represented by the chair the outgoing chair, the income, the bureau, let us... The chair of the commission and, and the chair and, of... And, uh, and, and the chair of the RECs, and we have five RECs. Oh. That should be sufficient okay. for, I mean, a meeting of uh, maybe six, seven, maybe six, seven. Yeah. That should be able to represent Africa. And that is the position I am taking as the president of Kenya. For any other meeting that we are going to have with all these uh, requests that we have a meeting between Africa and one other country. We respect the sovereignty of others. I think yeah. to ask for, to be, for a reciprocation is not to ask for too much. No. And for us to agree that let us have this kind of uh, setup. The only, um, uh, because I had a conversation with President Kagame and he, he actually led that particular position. I have had a conversation with Prime Minister Abiy. He believes very strongly that that should be the position mm. of, of our continent. Because, as you have said, if we, didn't, if we don't respect ourselves, nobody is going to respect us. And, and we should be able to take that kind of decision. Yeah. And part of that uh, respecting ourselves is when we say African problems, African solutions, we, we must be serious about the solutions. It cannot be rhetoric. It cannot be talk. It must be a company. So, by despite that wonderful rhetoric, people on X this week had a lot of fun showing that quote right next to none other than William Ruto walking into the Italian Senate chamber for this summit. So apparently he's not as convinced of his own rhetoric. That be said, let's let's find out before we get into your reaction guys and I do want to get your reaction. I want to talk about some of the issues that were also discussed at the summit and there were some interesting topics Interestingly, the Italian narrative in the Italian press on this, and Kobus, you're going to have a field day with this, was not about enhancing the relationship with Africa, but what the Italian government can do to restrict immigration from Africa. That was how it was spun domestically. But let's take a listen now to how France 24 covered the summit and what Maloney's agenda was. All of them here to discuss the issue about uh, how they're going to develop this big development plan uh, for uh, the uh, African continent and the link that Ms. Maloney is talking about between Italy and the African continent, the theme of this conference, talking about a bridge for common growth. Now, she has just pledged 5.5 billion euros in total in various aspects of this development plan, including things, uh, pilot projects she talked about, such as a uh, centre for professional formation on the issue of renewable energies in Morocco, as well as other projects in Ivory Coast, Algeria, Mozambique, Egypt, Congo, Ethiopia and Kenya. And she says this is just the starting point. So her view is that this is not a predatory uh, way of looking at things, not a non-paternalistic one, but one of common uh, uh, mutual uh, beneficiaries on both sides of the continent, Italy being a transit hub to the rest of Europe. 
Europe. But the key behind this whole issue is the issue of energy, that Europe will have access through Italy to uh, African energy resources. Uh, and in exchange, there will be an effort for greater investment and a move towards curbing the issue of illegal immigration across the Mediterranean into Europe. Kobus, that was a surprisingly honest assessment there that when they talk about energy, they're talking about carbon-based energy from Africa. And then at the end, there you saw the reference for immigration. So give me your reaction to the Italy-Africa summit, and that's going to pave our way into a conversation about the upcoming FOCAC conference that's coming up later this year. So the issue of energy is an interesting one because the agreement as it stands at the moment is ambiguous about what kind of energy we mean. Like, so a lot of so Ursula von der Leyen, the, the head of the European Council, was at this launch and she has been like headlining a lot of these green energy and just energy transition partnerships with African countries. All of those are sensibly focused on, f- f- like really put at the center of, of their work, decarbonization and non-carbon energy. The Italian one, I think, is vague on this and it's called the Mate plan which is named after the 1950s head of the Italian oil company ENI like any I think and they have a bunch of, of operations in in all around Africa I, I, I remember that they for example they're involved in gas exploration off the coast of Mozambique for example and it's named after him because he had this plan that Africa should use its resources and become economically independent and now now they're kind of referencing him in that so <laughs> but it's it's all very, very kind of ambiguous. You know, firstly, this is all about exports, right? It's not not about any kind of like electricity provision or energy provision within Africa. Like this is all about energy moving to Europe. And then it's also somehow magically supposed to jumpstart innovation and an investment in Africa to then keep all of these Africans from moving to Europe. So it's all couched, it's A, very vague, it's B, not really coherent in terms of how it's all supposed to work. It's also all mostly loans, right? Kind of like this isn't this is a, these are this isn't kind of like five point five billion euros of grants. You know, the grant component of this is going to be small if it is there at all. So, so this is a like a massive amount of debt and therefore also a massive amount of wealth transfer from the south to the north. You know, both in terms of the energy that's sent and then also in terms of the loans that are repaid. So, in that sense, it's kind of you know, to be cynical, it's kind of par for the course, right? There's nothing that Europe likes more than wealth transfers from Africa. Um, They've always liked it. They keep liking it right now. Um, So, you know, and and then it's all also couched, you know, kind of in the Italian press and I think explicitly, you know, kind of from Maloney herself as a summer magically having, like also stopping migration, which of course we know that, you know, kind of as a sector, you know, kind of the energy sector, and particularly the, the hydrocarbon sector, is very low levels of employment, right? You don't create jobs by extracting gas and oil. So all of this money is supposed to then kind of go into other kind of investment schemes, you know, like all, all relatively weakly defined. It's very difficult to say where this money is supposed to be coming from. And so the quote from Musafaki Mohammed, the AU commission chair that you, that you mentioned before, where, where he was saying they're not interested in promises that are not kept. I think this is, you know, beyond the, this particular thing, I think this is also a kind of a jab at Europe more generally. Generally, because there's nothing that Europe likes more than to announce a big number and then be extremely vague about where it's going to come from and then be like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be kind of like it will be built up from a mixture of private and public money. And, you know, it's like capacitating the private sector, you know, kind of bringing this money and then people kind of forget about it and move along. I mean, it's a Western approach. Well, that's and the Europeans are not alone in doing that. They're not alone. I mean, the, the Chinese and the Americans do the same thing. Three hundred billion dollars of imports from African countries, a billion dollars of vaccines, none of that materialized. So in a hundred billion dollars for the new Belt and Road kind of spending, again, that's probably a recycling of various funds as well. So not unique to the Europeans or the Americans. Yeah, but I mean, usually when Chinese investment is announced, it's announced, you know, kind of with a company already involved, right? Kind of here, there's very little proof that European companies are even willing to do any of these investments or I've even necessarily been kind of corralled into formation, you know, like none of that uh, that has been clarified. I think that's what makes those uh, European summit plus one Africa kind of not so credible for many African leaders because compared to China, they do know that when China says something, if they give big numbers, even though they won't reach that big numbers, they do know that some Chinese company is going to come and invest somewhere and they're going to show, you know, they're going to be a huge press release, you know, big media coverage about that 
bridge built here, that infrastructure financed here, at the end they can easily cover it. But for European countries, it's quite difficult for them to cover because you know you gave a big number, but you, we also do know that there's no big private companies going to come after you in the wake of your announcement. In Giro, last year when Ruto made those comments about no more of every African leader heading up to these different conferences, it was really, really popular. People love that idea because it is demeaning at its core that 54 countries or dozens of countries show up to see one country. That's weird, right? And so that idea that we heard in the soundbite was popular. Why is it then that didn't happen? Last year when you made that comment, we had a show the day after that, and we were laughing about that. And we, were, we pointed out the fact that it speaks a good rhetoric when, you know, is in front of the audience talking about all of that. But we said the reality is there's no real political power that any African organ, regional organization that have, that can go somewhere and talk for Africa. We said that before, that all those big countries the Kenyans, Nigeria, the South African, the Ethiopian, Egypt, they did not yield their sovereignty, their power to Musa Faki Commission to be able to go somewhere and to talk for them. We say that it's not going to work. And we even were questioning that if the others go, we're going to see if Ruto is going to go, maybe he's going to stay home. But surprisingly, Ruto went there. So the reality is it can speak a good game, but there's no regional political organization that has enough power and leverage to stand up and say, when I go in those summit, I'm going and I'm speaking for my region, I'm speaking for my country, I'm speaking for the continent. There's none. Even the African Union. And it's surprisingly, you have Musa Faiki present in that Italy summit, and you also have 25 head of state or their representative being present. You're like, guys, what's the point? What's the point? Either Musa Faki goes and he speaks for you, either you go there, Musa Faki, you don't need to go there. What's the point? There's so much magical thinking on both sides of this, right? Kind of because there's, there's, a, there's a ton of magical thinking on the European side. But then, you know, I completely agree with you. There's no political way in contemporary Africa that a country, that particularly a big country, is going to let the regional economic community speak for it. Like, there's just no way. There's no way that, like, if, if you think about the, the relationship between these countries, like, in, in what moment is Ghana going to be okay for Nigeria speaking for it? You know, it's never going to happen. Like, it's the same thing between Angola and South Africa, for example. Like, these countries want to negotiate these deals on their own because, like, regional and continental structures in Africa are really weak. But at the same time, and I think this is the real question that I think isn't addressed in all of this rhetoric around the, the Africa Plus One Summit, is why hasn't an African country kind of broken ranks and just negotiated these things on their own, right? I mean, Rwanda's doing it with the UK. Aren't we seeing these individual strong states just simply going it alone and, you know, kind of and setting the terms, right? There's a question that isn't actually raised, I think, so often. Now, I think they're trying to a certain extent. I think you have some country like South Africa having South Africa European Union Commission to talk about those relations. I think South Africa is also something with China in the bilateral level. Angola is something similar as well. DRC doesn't have something similar, but DRC has natural resources that you can leverage with China. But at some point, you got the feeling that they all go to those plus one summit just for the show of it just for the diplomatic relation of it, just to say, I'm present. I don't want to miss on something. Maybe something's going to be said there. I don't want to miss that. And I also want to have a bit, maybe a five, four minutes face-to-face -face with the head of state. If it was Xi Jinping, I would understand, you know, because of the relationship and the past, because of the weight of China in Africa. But come on. And I, I think I said that to Eric before. Italy, of all the countries in Europe, Italy calling up, I mean, I mean come on. Italy? I mean, come on. These guys have no money. They have nothing. And the thing with the five rights <laughs> government right now, she's trying I to mean, break ranks with the EU to negotiate their own deal for Italy. I understand that. But for African countries to go in that summit, but come on, I know, Italy? But Italy, come on. I mean, this is the, exactly. yeah, this is the poor man of the G7. In continental Europe, it's the third biggest economy now, right? Like it's, it's Germany, France, Italy, I think. I just, I don't think of Italy as a big economic power anymore, but maybe, again, I might be as blind to that. And I know we're going to get some emails from our Italian listeners going, you know, how dare you? But little fun fact here that Nigerian president Bola Tinubu, he was in Paris at the time of the summit, did not go to the summit. So interesting point that Nigeria, the largest economy and country on the continent, did not attend in person. And he was just two hours away. So he could have gone, but chose not to. And Ruto went. 
So very interesting. Let's just close out our discussion thinking about FOCAC because also this week, China's top diplomat for Africa, Wu Peng, who's been on our show before, he was on a tour of the continent. This happens, by the way, in the FOCAC years where Chinese diplomats led by Wu do start to make much more visible appearances. He didn't really specify what his agenda was when he was going out. There was no write-ups on it. We just saw his posts on X where he was saying, oh, I'm here today. Um, I think he went to the Gambia and he went to a number of smaller countries, uh, Guinea-Bissau as well. And, and he was in Nigeria as well. And I have to think that this is all part of the FOCAC preparations, that this is all part of the discussions that are happening now in the run-up before the conference, the gathering. We don't know if it's going to be a summit, if it's going to be a ministerial meeting. We don't know much about it at all yet. We don't even know the date. Usually it happens in November or December. Uh, That's what happened last year. Kobus, what's your thinking right now in terms of what Africans, and we talked about this last time, again, what they're going to be negotiating for. And when you see what happened in Italy, what does that guide you in terms of how they're going to position themselves in Beijing? I think it looks like the Africans are going to be focusing on industrialization and with that related to trade, to investment, to electrification and to ICT expansion. You know, so that's my kind of take at the moment. And that I think kind of puts it on a quite a fundamentally different kind of ground than these kind of discussions with Europe, particularly because, you know, kind of in speaking with China, those are things that China already has very high capacity in, that they are already have the mechanism set up to channel that investment and engagement and where they also have very high levels of domestic kind of oversupply, you know, particularly in relation to green energy. And also they're facing a lot of kind of barriers to entry in richer markets, you know, so that's true, particularly for the ICT sector. So there, I think there's a discussion there around high demand on the African side and high supply on the Chinese side that already kind of puts people roughly on the same page, even if they are, then have a lot of kind of details to work out. I think one of the bigger issues is going to be is trying to increase trade, and particularly agricultural trade, and then to try and also increase engagement in the agricultural sector to modernize it, you know, which China puts a lot of rhetorical energy behind. They're like, they have an entire kind of like range of kind of talking points on modernization now. It's one of their big kind of rhetorical fields. And that is particularly, I think, focused on Africa. And also just, just as a detail, a lot of that is couched in terms of alternative forms of modernization so like not like the west like the chinese model of modernization so that is that's an interesting thing and i think that'll be a big theme i think in 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 focac so i think that's kind of roughly what the africans are aiming at how much of that they actually get and how much how much actual you know, trade access and particularly investment access are going to get is a different question, I think. In, in relation to Wu Peng's visit, what struck me is, again, similar to Wang Yi and similar to Anthony Blinken, is very strong Sahel focus, it seems. You know, like very West Africa, all just, just around, around the Sahel and right next to the kind of countries involved. So interesting. Giro, I'm going to give you the last word today, reflect on everything that we've talked about and leave our audience with something profound to think about about the week we've had. For me, for this year, to look at the comment that Kobus has made about folk, I'm much more worried about how Africa is ready to deal with China in the new space of uh, the BRICS 2.0, the BRI 2.0, how Africa is really ready to manage all of that. Are we ready with the agenda to deal with the folk? Are we really ready to push for those things that we want to deal with China? I'm quite skeptical about that ability. I know the trade is going to be on the table. I know that uh, Uganda, for instance, has been pushing a lot. We didn't cover it. We didn't talk about it that much, but there was like the Chinese vice prime minister who also covered Africa, four countries in Africa, and trade was a part of his discussion with Uganda, asking for much more access for Chinese market and for African products. So all of that, for me, it's kind of worrisome for Africa and in the ability for us to be able to take advantage of the China that's changing. Just last word to end this discussion, just to give you a number, there's been 11 countries that have been covered for by Chinese diplomats between Wang Yi's trip to Wupang's trip. So all of like you have 11 African countries. That tells you a lot how China has been kind of dividing, conquering, using different high-level diplomats to kind of cover African countries for this year. So this is only the beginning of the year. So let's see how it's going to play out until we get to the full CAC. And just very quickly before we go, and if you want to hear more about the 2023 trade figures, including a breakdown of China-Africa trade last year, Kobus and I talked about that in our other show, the China Global South podcast, which you'll find also in the Africa feed as well. 
And then we had this fantastic discussion with Margaret Myers at the Inter-American Dialogue about the new shape of Chinese investment in Latin America, which Cobus and I said in that show, everybody in Africa should be listening to because what's happening in Latin America is also happening in China. So looking outside of the regions is so critically important. Gentlemen, thank you again for another hour that went by so fast. It was wonderful to have you both back on the show for our Week in Review. Listen, if you want to see all the great work that Giro and Cobus are doing every week, the only way to get it is through a subscription to the China Global South Project. It's the subscriptions that help keep our lights on and our ability to do this agenda-free, independent journalism that, again, you're just seeing... The carnage right now in the journalism business. I mean, layoffs are happening everywhere. The model is breaking down. This stuff goes away. And when it goes away, it's being backfilled by so much misinformation, disinformation, bad information, fake news. So we're just saying that if we go away and like a lot of media companies, there's not a lot that's going to be backfilling it. So we need your support. Subscriptions are very, very reasonably priced. We have half off rates for students and teachers. $10 a month for students and teachers and $99 a year. So if you'd like to get that discount, please email me with your academic email address, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com. For everybody else, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. And again, your subscriptions are really, really appreciated, but also you get a unique news service that nobody else in the world is providing. And we have services available in Arabic and French as well, and the French service at Projet Afrique Chine that Giro oversees with his team. So let's leave it there. I'm Eric Olander for Giro in Mauritius and Cobus in South Africa. A very, very big thank you for taking the time to join us, and we'll be back again next week with another episode of the China in Africa podcast. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrique on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic. Music.